Hello and welcome to Fish Hawk Live and the Great Lakes Fishing Podcast. Today, our guest is Captain Ross Robertson from Big Water Fishing. Ross is a full-time charter captain, and he's based on Lake Erie. Ross, thanks for joining the show today. Thanks for having me, guys. I, I noticed right off the bat, this, this is no shady November. People that aren't watching this, that aren't taking the advantage to jump on this and ask this question, Chris did not really pay attention to no shade November. <laughs> we were taking a look at it just a moments ago, and he thought I was baby face. But if you look real close, I do have really? kind of like an eleven o'clock shadow going. Uh, Ross, this may be a little contest there. Win. Ross spends a lot more time outside than I do, so he needs it for protection from the elements. And uh, Ross, uh, right now in the show, we're kind of getting away from destinations during the off season. We're talking some tackle, and I wanted to have you on to talk about a topic that you know very well. And that's planer boards. Uh, let's start simple. What are planer board boards, and what are they used for? Women usually in my boat call them flag thingies. Um, guys call them board thingies. But you know what they do? Regardless of what you call them, there they spread the lines out. And you know whether it's just being able to run more lines or it's able to get them away from the boat. You know for a spooking factor, um, it allows us to run multiple lines on each side of the boat. And it basically allows us to fish suspended, you know, near bottom or, or really high. So um, regardless of what you call them, they allow us to spread stuff out and run more lines really simply put. All right. Uh, I know there's different types of planer boards. You can kind of break down what those different types of planer boards are. And while we're going here, if you have any questions for Captain Ross, go ahead and put them in the comments. Doesn't matter if you're on Facebook or on YouTube. We'll see those comments and get them up there. Ross, uh, tell us a little bit about the different types of planer boards out there. Well, I would say the big two would be inline boards, which is what a lot of small guys use, you know, the ones that are roughly the size of a brick. And then you've got uh, big boards, um, regardless of what you want to call those as well. And, and you're going to have a tow line system. So a lot of the big boat guys in the Great Lakes or, you know, salmon guys even, you'll see they're going to run big boards where they have a mass system in some type of tow line. So you've got like weed whipper line or three, 400 pound Dacron or braid that are gonna go down to that. And really the big difference is, is big boards, they need more um, speed to pull them out and to keep them going. So generally speaking, uh, I know this is a little bit debatable. I would say 1.8 miles per hour roughly is about the slowest you wanna go. And then, you know, those guys will be in excess of let's say three miles an hour. Um, so they can be definitely more efficient because you're going to actually put like a shower curtain clip down that that line and you're going to have a little release there. Um, and then some guys will put a rubber band and what have you. Um, but then the fish is going to pull out of that or you're going to manually trip that out of that release. And then you're going to be fighting just the line. So that's kind of nice. Um, but just like anything, you know, there's disadvantages and, and pros. Like I said, you have to be going, generally speaking, quite a bit faster with those big boards uh, that with a mass style. And then also you can't really stagger your leads like we would with inline boards. So generally you're going to have a side because that line has to pop out and it, you have to basically hold it for a little bit and let it kind of pull out of the spread. It's not real safe. You're not going to run like I would maybe one lure 30 feet back and one 150 back. You know, you're going to have serious tangle issues if you, if you do, do that. So, um, but the big thing too is these, on a small boat, like, you know, like I run a 21, 23 footer, you know, are you going to have a mass system in that? Are you going to run enough lines to justify that? So a lot of smaller boat guys, especially since I can't really troll into big waves like a 31 Tierra could, I'm running little boards, you know, that are roughly this big, you know, like I said, not much bigger in size of a brick. And we, we've got to do things different for that. So those are the two big different types, inline, vors, big boards. All right, Ross, uh, I know this is uh, everybody loves an opportunity to kind of talk about the people that they work with and they partner with. Tell us about uh, the boards that you use and why you chose the boards that you use. I know you talk inline, but uh, brand size, all that type of thing. You know, I'm kind of I'm kind of a free agent with that. I, I run a lot of different stuff. I know this is not exciting, but um, and the reason is, is I don't know that there's one out there currently that I would say this is all I could use. Um, even the clips, you know, the clips are a big thing. So a lot of guys have a preference and, you know, I don't use a lot of braid. I use a little bit of braid. And so that's even going to change your preference because I would tell guys, and, and this is what I tell all my clients all the time. I do things a little different than everybody else, um, and different than what you're going to do or Chris, what you're going to do. And so I tell guys, go buy like one release. It's way cheaper this way to go buy several different brands. You know what I mean? 
and, and try out for your given circumstance. If you're using really thin mono, you know, that's not going to hold maybe if you're using like I do. Like I use a lot of Sunline um, monofilament, which is about 15 thousandths. So it's a little bit thicker than what most guys are using. And I do that just because of durability. And so I don't have to change the stuff every 10 seconds. Um, and a few other little little nuances that I've learned. But um, so I can get away with a different clip than maybe you could, especially if somebody's using, let's say, like a, a four pound, you know, diameter, like a fire line or something like that, where, you know, it's just sewing thread, like you're going to need a whole different release for that. So it's really tough when guys ask, hey, what board should I buy or what clip should I buy? There's not a good answer and it's not a staple thing. Um, you really need to look at those things and try them out depending on what type of lines you're using or going to be using and you've got to formulate a pretty good game plan there. All right. I know that uh, you're out fishing right now and you're telling me that, that the bite is hot right now. It's really good. Um, when you're putting out your boards right now, tell us a little bit. You said there's a lot of different ways and a lot of ways that everybody does it. How do you do it? If you're going to put out a, uh, a rig set up, put your boards out, what do you, what does that look like when you're deploying your boards? So, and again, I'm not saying that this is the way to do it or not do it. I don't understand why certain people do it the way they do it, but you know, that's fish and stuff. I like to run my shallowest lines on the outside. And a lot of people do it the opposite way, which makes no sense to me personally, but if it works for you, go for it. Um, you know, I like my, my generally what are going to be my shorter leads, but definitely my shallowest stuff on the outside. Personal preference, see, I, I think over time, you know, I've, I feel that I want my deepest stuff closest to the boat, rather it's a spooking factor, you know, because obviously the deeper fish are probably not going to spook as much as if I'm running a really high line. I don't want that right at the boat. Uh, and then also realistically, I mean, how many of you guys have been out there and you're, and you're fishing, if you're going to hang up on bottom or if you're going to catch a junk fish or something like that, I don't want that line to be all the way on the outside. So I have to deal with that more frequently or if I was to hang up. Um, so that's why I like having my shallow stuff on the outside. And then I kind of work that inversely closer. And, it, you know, as you start the day, most days I'm going to have one high in the middle, you know, a little deeper. And then the deepest one, maybe it's a snap weight even or something like that closest to the boat. So um, that's that changes hour to hour, day to day. But that's generally my deal. Or if you're watching this on video, you know, I kind of think of this philosophy. I want my stuff to kind of look like a V. And that deeper stuff's going to be on the inside. And that also makes it easier when I'm clearing things out. Um, so that those outside fish can kind of come over the inside boards and lines. And then also I can just change the stuff a lot faster uh, because I can float things around on the outside. So if I catch a fish really high, I'll float that right around um, and put it right back on the outside. And that's to me much easier than if I was trying to do it the opposite way. All right. How about the board itself? How, how are you clipping it on and make sure, sure it stays on, but that it, it does what it's supposed to do when a fish comes on there. I know uh, I've fished with a lot of different captains who do it a lot of different ways. Uh, what's kind of the way that you do it? Well, I'm getting, I'm getting older, Chris, believe it or not. I know my, my baby face here with the uh, ginger locks there, it's hard to believe, but I'm probably not as fast as I used to be, but I'm getting maybe a little smarter. So uh, some of the guys will, will rig that front clip so that it releases. Um, and in certain cases, that's probably a whole lot easier. But my buddies that do that, I just tell them that they're older and lazier and not as fast as I am. So I don't like that system because I don't want to start jerking. I don't know how many fish I get in the boat every year, really every week even. And I look and I'm like, man, that fish barely, barely was hooked. And so out there jerking rods and pulling around doesn't seem like a smart thing to me. Um, so the inversely also, I don't want those fish to, you know, if you get a really good fish, like we had some really nice fish today and they were definitely, they were pulling the board behind the boat, but they still kind of stay in their lane, if you will, if you can kind of picture this, where if you have that front clip, that's going to pull out, that thing's going to come out if a fish really dings it good. And now all of a sudden that fish can glide into your, your other lines where when I have those boards and I'm still manually removing them. Um, yes, it's a little more work, but those fish stay in their lane because we've got a really good problem on Lake Erie right now. So maybe, you know, this doesn't apply to you if you live on, you know, the Missouri River system or, you know, Mille Lacs or something. But for me, when we have multiple fish on and I'm dealing with that, I kind of choose which one and how I'm doing it. Um, and by having those boards still attached and always having them attached, um, I can kind of pick and choose how I want it to work instead of them choosing for me. Well, that brings up a great point when you've got those fish and you're bringing them in. Um, what's the best way to get those boards off in a GIF when you're trying to bring fish in and get them in the net as fast as you can? 
Well, I mean, I think one of the most overlooked things, I know everybody's always asking me, you know, what's your favorite color lure? Or what clip should I buy? And like I said, those things really vary so much. I think it's the little devil details that really make a difference. And for me, you know, I'm using eight, point, uh, eight foot three inch Shimano uh, Comfrey rods. And I like that for many reasons, for fighting the fish, for keeping them out of the waves and all that stuff. But that's a fairly long stick. You know, I'm 6'3", but I still can't reach that, right? So I have my guys reel from up towards the console in my boat. You know, and most guys do it the opposite way. Again, I tend to do things backwards for most guys. But I want those guys back, you know, towards the trolling motor or away from the motor. And that way I can work around them, number one. But the other thing is, is it's a lot easier to get those rods, um, you know, the bore off without these guys, you know, everybody wants to reel from the back of the boat. And I don't care if you're using seven foot rods, I can't take that thing off if it's hanging off, you know, the boat four feet. So I, I want those guys to start reeling up, up towards my console and that way I can work around them and I can get those boards off really easy. So I, I often stand on the back deck or that back of the boat. That's kind of my little working area and I kick guys out of that really quickly. Um, and it just makes it so much easier, uh, especially like today. We had 25, 30 mile an hour winds and, you know, you don't want to be hanging all over the boat and I can get those boards off super easy. So um, there's a lot of different clips out there. And, you know, when you, the more you use them, the more, you know, simply it gets to take them off, to be honest. Well, it's good that you bring that up. That was actually going to be my next question was what rod do you use and why do you use it? And you kind of answered that. Um, how about how important is it? as uh, someone who's going to go out and run planer boards to have all those planer boards kind of on the same rod setup? I, I think it's incredibly important. I mean, I like, I like the Shimano Compres that I'm using and they're, I'm, they're, I actually designed a new Compre for them that we're using for our braided lines now. It's a more moderate action and we're using that for, um, you know, spinners and things like that or live bait fishing, bottom bouncers, boards like that dead sticking. Um, and so, I mean, the rods are really, really important to me, but you don't have to have super fancy stuff. Uh, I mean, to, to spend more than a hundred bucks on a trolling rod in most cases is not necessary, um, but you need to have the stuff the same so that when you're, you're looking at whether, really, I don't really watch rod tips, but the actions, you, you don't want to be mismatching things. You know, in, in trolling, uh, a bunch of my buddies, their wives all call it uh, the science of trolling. And I guess it really is in that it's not how fancy your equipment is, but you need the stuff all the same. Um, so whatever your price point or your budget is, you know, try to get something that, that fits into that. And that's why I kind of steer clear of some of the crazy stuff or some of the manufacturers, you know, that tend to change stuff every two years. I like the stuff that I can know I can get and get another one of and make sure that I match that up because it's really, really important to have the same stuff, especially for with your line counter reels and making sure, you know, check those, calibrate them. You know, I've got videos on my YouTube page showing you how to calibrate the line counters, uh, which is basically making sure just the right amount of line is on there. So the line out and the counter match, which I guarantee most people watching this, your stuff's probably not. Um, and that, that's a huge difference. It's all these little devil details that, that make a huge, huge difference, not, you know, what color you're using necessarily. All right, we're starting to get some questions, and uh, if anyone has any questions for Captain Ross, go ahead and put them in the comments, and we'll get to those. Uh, tell us a little bit. This is kind of the, probably the, the question that I hear most often is, what's the best way to tell if you have a fish on your planer board line? A lot of time. You know, I mean, unfortunately, it's just like jig fishing. If, if you were to ask me, how do I know how to jig fish, right? You know, you, you got to put your time in. But the, all those little things like we talked about, having – you know, all of your rods and reels the same. It makes a big, big difference. Um, I know that this one right now, if, if I was looking you in the eye, you'd probably, I know I'm going to get a smirk out of you at least, is I don't want my clients, generally speaking, to know that there's fish on. I know that I probably shouldn't have said that out loud, but a lot of guys get jumpy, right, when they know that one's on. So I don't set the flags to go down or anything, but what I do is, is I change the pull points. So if you can kind of visualize this, regardless of the brand that you have, a lot of the rear clips are up towards the top. And what I do is I move that rear clip to about the middle to the bottom two thirds of the board. And what that does is it causes that nose to go up and it causes that tail to go down. And it makes it a lot easier when you start reeling on that or you grab the rod that if you have any weight on that, that it, excuse me, that you're gonna notice much more drastically that, that that there is something on that because that nose goes really drastically up and that tail of the board goes down. Um, so just a little tweak like that makes a huge, huge difference in being able to quote unquote read the boards. 
Um, because guys all the time, they go, oh, I can tell when a four pound walleye is on there. Well, I got news for you. I've seen when there's 10 pound fish on them, people don't know that they're on, but it's not the 10 pounders, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have them like we do in Lake Erie, it's those four inch white bass or the seven inch walleyes first of the year, you know, fish, because you can't catch a, a big old nice walleye if you've got one of those on in most cases. So it's that little junk fish or those little weeds, you know, kind of to your point, that are the most important things to, you know, to notice. And when in doubt, check it out, man. I love little silly sayings, but they're, they're there for a reason. Most guys probably do not check their stuff enough. Yeah, that was going to be my next question is how often do you, are you checking those lines when you're out trolling with your boards? Probably not enough. You know, I, I'm, I, again, it's one of those kind of do as I say, don't do as I do. Um, one of my clients told my mom that uh, I'm the best board reader that he's ever seen. So I don't know if that's a compliment or not, or that's going to get me anything. It's not going to get me a discount on my Dairy Queen, but it's, you know, when you do it a lot, like I do, you should probably check them more than I do. Um, and still there, there's, there's times, especially like in the summer, you're fishing deep um, that I probably don't even check my stuff enough. And there's, there's definitely a little bit of a delicate balance in there, but You'd be amazed too. I think that what happens when you, when a lot of guys catch fish, I see it in my boat all the time. And you know, let's say we're catching something. I don't care what it is. We're 50 feet behind the board, and guys start getting stuff messed up. And all of a sudden, the fish, you know, the the, the hot lead or the program that was working, you don't actually even have on the water because you started mixing things up. So it's a really good time to kind of check and maybe even restructure things uh, in your program. So if you were catching them, you know, in fairly long leads, you know, to take some of those shorter leads and maybe make those a little bit deeper to try to, you know, pull two fish out of a pod instead of a one. Yeah, I would try that out at Dairy Queen. I mean, the worst that they can do is tell you no. So I, I say go for I, it. I, I have, and they did. <laughs> All right. We've got a, a question coming in from YouTube from DW8977, and he says, uh, do you use your planer boards as they come, or do you make changes? Do you do any kind of manipulation to make those uh, work better than they do out of the package? Chris, you already know the answer to this. I don't use anything stock. You know, most of the things I, I like to modify up, and, and fortunately, a lot of the companies I work with, they end up becoming a uh, stock thing by based on the customizations that we're doing. But um, yeah, I've got one of the guys that, that I work with that he's made me arms, you know, for the board, because a lot of you guys would probably realize those plastic arms, they kind of warp over time and they go down and it causes that, that board to pitch and roll. So I've got metal arms uh, that I replace all mine with. Um, I use a bucktail wire uh, as far as on that tattle system or whatever you want to call it, the spring system on the back. I use a heavier spring as well. Um, I honestly don't, there's there's very little stock that I use on the boards. It's kind of disappointing that most of the manufacturers have them where you almost have to buy a bunch of stuff and, and redo it. I think everybody out there is kind of frustrated with that. Um, and same thing for me, you know, we're putting different clips on that, that fit that nature. That's why I have multiple sets of boards in my boat um, because, you know, there's just, there's not one situation that's going to do it all, unfortunately. And speaking of situations, what do you typically, I guess typically is probably not a good word, but uh do you run lead core with your boards? Do you, what what kind of lines are you typically using when you're when you're running your boards? Uh, what do you got behind them? You know, where we're at, um, and we can run three lines now. So we don't do a lot of lead core. Not that it doesn't catch fish. I know there's guys that definitely that live in your neck of the woods that come out here and, and do some lead core. And I've probably owned 40 reels with lead core on them right now. But we don't have to. So we do a lot of flat line trolling, you know, just regular monofilament, maybe straight braid. Um, or using snap weights with monofilament. And in most cases, that's just going to be a quicker, faster deal. And it's going to work, you know, over the season just a, a lot better. Um, and then we, nothing to do with planer boards, but we may be using something at the boat, uh, whether it's a bottom bouncer or a dipsy diver or something like that without a board that's going to take up for that deeper spread so that we wouldn't need to use, you know, um, let's say 10 colors of lead or something like that. So depending on where you're at in, in, in the lake, it's going to change as well. Uh, but for me, it's all about efficiency and speed. Um, the faster I can get them out and, and fishing again, the more productive we're going to be, especially when we're on some of these smaller pods that are active biters, which we seem to have had for the last year or two. Um, but I pride myself in my speed and efficiency and with just regular pointer boards and not having a lot of fancy devices on there, I can do that. Is there anything different that you do with them when you're using braid compared to using the mono? Just the clips. You know, you got to use different clips because... Either the clips that you have for 
that are going to work great for mono are either going to get chewed up realistically or reality is is they're going to slip and then you got to start wrapping them and i don't wrap anything so uh, you know that just is, is a recipe for disaster i know a lot of guys do that and i understand why you wouldn't have another set of boards or something but for me that's just not practical um and then i've got some that i use too i've got a, a whole nother set of boards that i use which i realize as people listen to this they're like man i'm not gonna have three sets of boards but then i have another set that i use when it's really cold out because some of those clips that hold really well um you know those setups they don't work as well when it's really really cold so i almost kind of have things set up you know with weights even too uh, i encourage guys to mess with uh with the weights and if you watch any of my videos on my own youtube stuff i've kind of shown where some of that i, I mess with these and chris i i I'm going to throw an elephant in the room here. I mean, when you jig for walleyes, like if you were down on the Detroit River with me, which me and you have talked about doing, you know, you got half, five eighths, three quarter ounce jigs, right? You got a rod for that. Is that the same rod you're going to pitch a 16th ounce jig in a natural lake with? Probably not, right? Or hopefully not. And it's the same thing with planer boards. If you have one setup and you're trying to do everything with that, finesse fish, fish slow, power fish, use heavy weights, it's yes, you can do it just like that jig rod, but chances are you're really not going to have nearly the results I am if I'm kind of tweaking these things. And it really does make a big difference. All right, let's talk about uh, lead lines. How much line are you letting out uh, on the backside before you're attaching your planer boards as you're setting your spread out? Well, you know, I've, it depends on, on what you're doing, right? So if you're using one ounce, two ounce sinkers, or if you're using uh, like a Northland Rumble B or something that's got a shallower lip, it still gets fairly deep versus like a Northland Rumble stick, for example, that's going to get deeper. The nice thing is most of these manufacturers have some fairly, I would say they're not completely accurate, to be honest, but they're fairly accurate charts to get you in the game. And I'm not going to make, you know, I put a lot of hard work in. I'm not going to share all my, all my deep, deep secrets, but I spent a lot of time, you know, taking these things out, banging bottom and figuring out where the baits that I use consistently, where they're actually at compared to where the people say that they're at or different apps and different stuff like that, you know, that's out there. And you'd be surprised at how far that stuff is off. And maybe most people would say, Hey, two or three feet off is okay for them where two or three feet off for me is no good. You know, that's, that's, that's a bad deal because now when you compare that to another bait, so now maybe we're five or six feet off. And so if you're using, you know, lure ABC and you're three feet off one way, and then another one, you're off three feet, the other, you, you can't get those in that window, if that makes sense. So if we know that the fish are 15 feet down, I may want to try a different lure to see if I can get better results or bigger fish or what have you uh, from day to day. And I want to make sure that those are exactly the same. So the lead thing is, is is crazy. And then just even the calibration, you'd be surprised at how many reels when we do these little teaching schools and stuff, the guys that don't have their stuff calibrated and their reels are off 10 or 15 feet from, you know, line counter over here to the one that's in their right hand. So all those little things, like the guys are always looking for, you know, the golden ticket, but it's, it's just a lot of little things that you put together that you're going to notice the guys that are more consistent and um, allow you to just be more efficient. All right, here's one from Josh Lewis on Facebook. He wants to know if you're running fluorocarbon leaders on your mono rods. I do not. I don't run leaders at all. Um, occasionally, I'll put in a swivel three or four feet up, and I, you know, I carry those uh, pre-dyed. I try not to use them, to be honest, but I will use those, especially if we're using snap weights or something like that, where we've got the opportunity for that thing to get spun up. Um, rather, we're doing some hard turns, fishing really deep, some heavy weights, or a little white bass. Not that I ever catch stuff like that, but you know, a little junk fish or something can really just wreak, wreak havoc on a rod and reel. So um, I would encourage you to use just a small little dual lock snap. Um, and then if you're getting into some twist issues to run your swivel three or four feet up, but I use the same, no leader. All right, All right uh, uh, you, you brought up the word uh, turns. Turn. Tell me about uh, your, your boat and kind of how you're handling the boat when you got boards and, and why you do what you do. Uh, as far as making those turns and, and kind of running patterns when you're trolling? I'm kind of old school, believe it or not, a little old school. I, I rely on my Minn Kota, either an Altrex or an Altera, depending on the time of year. And I'm doing 90% of my steering with that bomb out. And, you know, even when you're going slow, if you turn that thing off, you're going to find out you got just a hot mess. I mean, it's amazing at what that motor even just barely on a two setting or a three setting was barely just barely moving a heavy boat like mine is that it keeps you going in the right direction. And a lot of times if I need to go faster or if I'm trying to trough, for example, like if we're in some big waves, like we were a couple days ago, 
I'm going to use my kicker also. And so, you know, maybe you don't need the kicker. Maybe it's you're, you're trying to slow down, but I'm going to use multiple forms of boat control. So I'm going to put a drift bag out, maybe if I'm trying to slow down or if I need a little extra speed to keep from dog legging, I'm going to use that kicker. But that back of the boat is kind of unlike a tiller boat. I'm using that just for a little speed up and slow down where the bulk of, of my stuff is actually with my, my trolling motor on the front. And it's that system, as my boats keep getting bigger, you know, I'm running a, basically a 23 foot Ranger now uh, compared to a 20 footer I started with a, a number of years ago. And the boat is just getting heavier and heavier as they get bigger. But now I'm running lithium batteries and it's amazing because I can run, I could probably not even use a kicker in most cases because I have so much increased power with that. And that, that has really changed the game with those Dakota lithiums because I can run without fear of killing my batteries. And it allows a lot of the errors that I would have, I can just basically power out of those now. How, how about, do you, do you move the boat to try to get some action on those boards and try to try to get, you know, maybe induce a strike or see if, you know, maybe a little bit faster, maybe a little bit slower kind of does the trick. And, and how, do, how do you do that? For sure, but for about the last three years, it seems like we've had so much wind. I haven't needed any extra action. I've tried to slow it down, if anything. I don't know if you guys, we were kind of joking about that with the wind. I mean, it just seems like it blows crazy. Um, but yeah, I mean, there's definitely, you know, like the little rabbit button on the Minn Kota there, that'll take you to a 10 setting, like in two seconds, and that'll give you a nice little speed burst, or even just turning the motor off for a second or two. Um, same thing, like my Mercury Kicker, I can put that in neutral. I, I run a tiller model. So I can put that thing in a neutral and I'm usually running at low enough RPMs that I don't need to you know, dial the speed back and I just kind of put it in a lot of gear quickly. Um, or I'll even put it in a neutral, like if we have a big fish or something on to kind of slow down a little bit to help those guys reeling. Um, so there's just a lot of little tweaks. Like I said, when people fish with me, they're usually not impressed from the standpoint of thinking that there's some golden ticket. I just do a lot of little tweaks and have a lot of kind of little audibles. And when you put those all together, it really, really makes a difference. But there's not like one single thing. But, you know, having something like a drift bag and having that kicker motor, depending on the day, like from this week, you know, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it was totally different than what we needed. And I needed a drift bag on Monday. Uh, we used the kicker on Tuesday. And today we use kind of a combination of those as the wind was changing. So having those little tools that when the conditions change that you aren't, you know, left in the, in the mud, it makes a big, big difference. All right, here another question from Facebook. Jim Lemon wants to know if you troll into the waves, do you always go with it? How do the waves uh, kind of determine which way you're going to be trolling? Shameless plug, I rely on my fish hawk. <laughs> so, you know, you basically want to be going with the current in most cases because that's going to give you the most stable action and it's going to, um, it's going to keep you from tangle. You know, when, when you start trying to go into the current, it usually is a bad deal. The only exception I would say to that as a general rule of thumb would be if you're fishing bottom, because a lot of times we have, I think it's called a reverse psych, it's technically the term, you know, where when the water pushes across the lake and then you get that return flow. So the bottom current and the top current is actually the opposite as they're kind of crossing each other. So if you're fishing like bottom bouncers or something, for example, or fishing just controlled fishing bottom, a lot of times you are going to go be going into that a little bit. Um, but again, it depends on where you live on Lake Erie, where I'm at, generally speaking, when the waves are over, whatever it may be, I'm not going to troll into them regardless. Um, but often that current is going to be, I'm trying to buck that. So I don't want to do that anyhow. So use your fish hawk. It's amazing difference because especially when it's really not that rough and you think you can go left or right or up or down and you look at when you do that and you see how much your speed changes, you'll be, it'll blow your mind on three or four tenths will change. And that's actually why you're not catching fish not because of the direction they're going. Excellent, excellent stuff, Russ. Uh, how about, how many boards do you run on each side? What does that setup look like? You know, now we, we've kind of in the last, I guess it's maybe maybe two years now that we, we changed. We went from two rods in Ohio to three. And, you know, it just depends. I have a lot of days I have, you know, two people in my boat, sometimes one like tomorrow, got one guy I'm fishing with. So obviously we're going to run what we legally can, but I try you know, in the summertime, I'm going to run some dipsies or something at the boat deep, right? So I'm going to kind of split that up a little bit. Um, but in the spring and the fall, I may start with four boards on a side, which is kind of a nightmare for most people. If you're watching this, you're trying to get into fishing boards. Do not do that. It's a nightmare. Um, six is a handful. Eight is an absolute disaster. Um, but when I'm trying to figure out what's the hot color, the lead, the type of lure, or, you know, realistically, 
the depth is, is what I'm trying to figure out in most cases. And then I'll, I'll bring it back down to six uh, because it's just so much more manageable um, and it's so much easier to kind of not get lazy, basically. Um, if you're starting off with boards, don't do eight. Don't do four aside. It's a, it's a bad, it's a bad deal. It causes divorces, friendships to end, um, trips to the tackle store. Need I go? Do I need to go on? I, th I think you've covered it. Um, a lot of people put those rod holders on the gunnels. Other ones will have uh, the tree up there. How do you kind of get those rods set up while you're out trolling? Dude, the trees are for me. The trees. Um, I run Bird's Custom Tackle Swivel Trees, and I'm going to tell you, it's. I would argue it's difficult to do what I do without that. And I see guys with tubes and cradles and all that. And again, it, it's personal preference to a certain extent, but like with tubes, I, I use some tubes on the back of my boat, but I don't like having to reach out and over the boat. To me, it just doesn't make sense, especially since those rods may become dipsy rods in the summertime for me. And now I've got it in my boat, at least, you know, your boat could be different, whoever's listening to this, but I've got to reach out. Out big time and, and you watch yourself on video what happens when you take one of those out of that it's a crazy deal man you, you put a lot of slack in you lose a lot of time it's not nearly as fast so i use a combination of birth swivel trees because i can get them in and out really easy and i have like three or four rods in a really small footprint which is important so i can get those line angles up and that line is not going to touch the water all the way out and i can run a board let's say a hundred and some feet out and that makes a big difference when it's flat calm or really rough on you know, not having tangles, not uh, not changing the action of that lure also. Uh, and then I run some Burt's riser cradles that are staggered uh, for those like inside lines back down the gunnel more towards the stern. So, and then I have a few extra, like I said, Burt's uh, um, uh, tubes on the back, but I have those basically as just clear rods and getting things out of the way or setting stuff, just a place to put something so it doesn't get broke or, or in the way. Extra rod holders is super critical. I see guys all the time, they got six rod holders on their boat and they're running six rods. I promise you that's a recipe for disaster. All right. We got uh, another one here from Jim. And Jim wants to know if you run two baits on one line, like a deep diver, shallow bait on a three-way. Do you ever do anything like that? You know, back in the day, we used to do that quite a bit. Um, you know, now that we can run three lines, I think it's a better deal to – you know, to stick to one in most cases. And then we, depending on where you're at, uh, what state or what country, you know, you've got a hook regulation. So you got to be careful with that too. But uh, I don't do much with the cheater lines anymore, truthfully, just because it's, it's generally more of a pain in the ass. Um, if you're fishing by yourself, maybe that's not the case or maybe one buddy. Uh, but when you're usually fishing with several people like I do, and I can legally run nine lines, it's just easier to have each independent one. Ross, you've been talking a lot about why you want to use planer boards and why they're so effective. Is there ever a situation where you're like, today's not a day for planer boards? What would those situations look like? For sure. You know, in, in, in my home waters of Lake Erie, it, it probably isn't as prevalent as other places. But if you watch the tournaments and the things that are happening, let's say on other places on, on the Great Lakes, so let's talk about like Saginaw Bay, Green Bay, Bay to Knock, uh, certain sections of Lake Ontario. When you have fish that are stacked up in a in a close proximity, especially if they're bottom oriented, you know, a planer board is probably not your best deal because when you're trying to control fish bottom, there's just a lot more room for air and there's a lot more time where if, if I'm going to spend all my time trolling around in a circle or needing to be in a small area, let's say smaller than a football field, man, you should probably think about, you know, using something like Mega Live and, and, and working on individual fish. Uh, but where I'm at, the walleyes move just a tremendous amount, and we have a lot of water to cover. And so planer boards are going to let me take a 200-foot swat, let's say, and just cover so much water to stay on those moving fish. So it probably doesn't apply generally as much on my home body of water, but on other places, I would tell you there's a lot of times you probably should put the boards away. Ross, it's been good having you on the show, and I think we've covered quite a bit. Was there something going in that you were thinking of that you wanted to talk about that I didn't ask you about today? The only thing I would probably say is these boards that are out nowadays, I don't care what brand manufacturer is, there, there's a lot more manufacturers. We've seen some copycat boards and some things like that, but paying attention to the weight. So when you look at those, if you bought brand X, right, and 10 years ago and, and have one now to try to match them all up, they may have zinc weights where they used to be lead weights or now you get, you look at them. Um, I've taken many weights, Chris, to the post office right here in small town, Marblehead, Ohio. And the lady looks at me. I'm pretty sure she is not happy with me, 
but she she humors me and she lets me weigh these things and you'd be amazed at how the weights are different and i've even gone with some of my stuff i've, I've actually cut the weights down and i've got like two different sets of weights so i've I've noticed that when you're pulling different things, uh, the weight just tremendously changes how that board runs. But that's probably getting a little deep for today. But realistically, just measure those weights. If you have different brands or if you bought a board, you know, 10 years ago and now you try to replace it, check those out because the chances are they're different. And then that's why your boards are running different and they're not staying in line or they're kind of wiggling and wobbling out there. Um, that's that's a big deal. Well, Ross, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your wealth of knowledge. If you want to find out more about Ross, you can go to his website. It's bigwaterfishing.com. He's also on Facebook at Big Water Fishing and uh, YouTube channel. If you really want to get down deep and dirty with Ross, that's a great place to find him. He's got tons of videos on there, lots of how-to and lots of just kind of fishing videos. So uh, find him out there and uh, a, a super wealth of knowledge type of guy and a guy that doesn't mind sharing it with you. With you. So appreciate you, Ross. Thanks for having me on.